And a very good evening to you and welcome to Bible study. I'm sure we're going to have a great time tonight as we are looking at a theme that uh, would be curious to some people when they hear the title. And what is the title? And it is simply Feeding on Ashes, taken from Psalm 102. This is the second study, and we're looking at Psalm 102, going verse by verse and seeing the panoramic view of what God is seeking to do, what he's seeking to say, what he's seeking to transmit through Israel to the nations of the earth. There are both promises, prophecies, and even there seems to be an ominous threat over Israel, and they are going through a hard time in the time of the psalmist's revelation. This would have been said of Israel many times, and we know that. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless this study. Bless everybody that hears. Father, I pray you'll restore to the church a love of the prophetic word, a love for your word, and Lord, a desire to know the word and live the word to the glory of your name. We ask it in that name. Amen. Psalm 102, when you first start reading it, you think that it's about the plight of an individual. Well, Israel is made up of many, many individuals. Each person is precious in the sight of the Lord. We know that. Everyone on earth is known absolutely by God. He cares for you, says the Apostle Peter, 1 Peter 5, 7. He cares for you, you as an individual, even though you might be part of a massive world and a massive nation and uh, a nation that he has set his love upon, he still knows you as an individual. God is so great that he can encompass the world with his love, and yet he is so personal that he knows all about you. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are but dust. Now we got so far uh, the last time we were together and we looked at the suffering, tormented nation because we realised very soon into reading Psalm 102 that the focus goes from an individual cry of an individual person to the cry of a nation. We were able to get an understanding of why Jesus wept over Jerusalem. My take on that, my concept of that, is that Jesus wept over Jerusalem because he could prophetically see down through the ages to the time even of the Holocaust where six million Jews would be systematically, brutally, and with precision murdered by, in fact, the Nazi regime. The Holocaust or the Shoah, which means the burning, is the time of great sorrow. The Bible talks about a time of Jacob's trouble. And I believe that commenced in AD 70 and stretches right through until the return of Israel back into the land. And if you are able to get some volumes, perhaps uh, by um, uh, Dr. Gilbert, Martin Gilbert, now deceased, great historian, you will read some of the tremendous upheavals that Israel, scattered throughout the nations, have had to put up with. The pogroms, the persecutions, the being hunted out of villages when they'd set up uh, wonderful uh, communities and were doing nothing but blessing a local uh, region. And yet they were turned upon and turned out and thrust out and often murdered. And uh, they would, the Jews would ask themselves, why is this happening to us? What have we done? Are we so evil? Are we so corrupt? Because that's how they were portrayed. And that's why the uh, village people often turned on them, because they were seen as having too much control, too much power. What if the case was that God had given them the gift to be successful, the gift 
to make money, to do wonderful things with it as a result. Now, the Bible says that God spoke to Israel and said, I will not only make you wealthy, I'll give you the gift of being wealthy and making wealth. And that indeed has been the case. Psalm 102 talks about the anguish that uh, not only an individual Jew would feel, but also Israel as a nation. And we shuddered a little bit last time when we looked at verse 9 of Psalm 102, and we read these words, I eat ashes as my food. And I was mentioning uh, then, and I mentioned it again, that the captured spy and uh, resistance worker, um, Odette Sampson, was in one of the prison camps where they were indeed uh, incinerating, cremating the dead and yet to die Jews. And she was out in the exercise yard uh, given an hour just to uh, walk around and limber up a little bit, which she did, and she could taste ashes in her mouth as she just uh, relaxed and uh, did the walking round and round and round the compound. She realised that it was coming from the great uh, chimneys and she realised that they were burning these innocent people whom they'd gassed or tortured to death or worked to death or starved to death. And she realised that mm, she was tasting the uh, ashes of the bodies of the innocents. And it just almost drove her mad with both fury and distress. And this is what the, uh, this is what the psalmist says. He says these very, very, very words, I eat ashes as my food and mingle my drink with tears because of your great wrath. That brings us to the second point uh, that we're studying tonight, and that is the sovereignty of God over Israel. God has warned Israel if they turned to idols, if they turned to living in conjunction with and after the pattern of the heathen, he would chasten them, he would judge them. He would ultimately, if they persisted in rebellion, cast them out of the land. And uh, Jesus, in uh, chapter 23 of Matthew's Gospel, talks very, very avidly and vividly about the crimes of Israel of his day and warns them that in the not too distant future they would face the judgment of God because formalism had taken the place of a living, worshipful and revelatory faith. You see, it's so easy to fall into the trap of religion. It's so easy to move away from the reality of the presence of God and living in obedience to God and just going through a, a lifeless routine. And this is what Judaism had become, so much so that a hardness had come into the hearts of those leaders, those princes of Israel who turned on Jesus and without conscience were glad to see him being slain first at the whipping post, being whipped to within uh, the last breaths of his life, so much so that he couldn't even carry the beam that made the uh, cross complete on which he would die. And Simon the Cyrene came out of the crowd and was told, you take that beam and you take it to Golgotha. And that he did. And Jesus was in his weakened state, placed on the cross and was crucified. Now we know that he was lifted up between heaven and earth and he had still communion with the Father until all of a sudden he tasted not only the first death but began to experience the second death where God is absent. And that is the hell that we all should fear.
and want to stay well away from. We don't want to be absent from God. We want to be in his presence where there is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. That's where we want to be. And Jesus tasted death for every man. But death is uh, in plural here. There is a first death, the physical death. He faced that. He took upon himself form of a servant, became obedient unto the cross and unto death. And not for his own sins, but the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and the sins of the world. The outworking of the sin nature is sinful acts. So we are saved from the Adamic nature of rebellion uh, and the sin that made it necessary for the Lamb of God to be offered without spot unto God. And that's what he did. But prior to that, he saw this terrible anguish that would come on his people Israel. He loved his people. John, in the first chapter, says in verse 11 and in verse 12, he says these words. He said, he came unto his own, his own, his own. He came unto his own. And who were his own? Uh, Not the Gentile believers. He came unto Israel and his own received him not. And of course, Isaiah prophetically in the 53rd chapter of his prophecy said, we hid, as it were, our faces from him. We turned away from him. And both Peter and then later Stephen, well, they they proclaimed the reality of it all by saying, you with wicked hands took the prince of heaven, and you murdered him, you killed him. And uh, in a sense, he was not murdered because he laid down his life for his friends and for all those that were part of redemption's plan, which is the whole world potentially and specifically for those who believe. And so here we go back to Psalm 102. I eat ashes as my food, mingle my drink with tears because of your great wrath. For you have taken me up and thrown me down or thrown me aside, as the NIV says. My days are like the evening shadow. I wither away like grass. But you, but you, And here we have the sovereignty of God. We have the sovereignty of God in uh, the edicts that he declares, the principles that he proclaims. We have uh, the sovereignty of God in the revelation of his will, of his nature and of himself. And we have the revelation of God and the sovereignty of God in chastening and in their continued rebellion they were cast out in judgment out of the land. And that's why Jesus wept, because he knew. He knew the truth of the uh, prophecy of Ezekiel. Are you very familiar with Ezekiel? You should be. It's wonderful. Um, Ezekiel was called to be a prophet to the nation. And he sees the sheep of God in chapter 34 Verse 5 and verse 6, he says, They were scattered because there was no shepherd. Why was there no shepherd? Had the shepherd deserted them? No, they had deserted the shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. Very descriptive. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and over every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched or looked for them. When you go back into Isaiah, he has the same revelation. 
And in chapter 40, he commences the second part of uh, the book of Isaiah by saying, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. And he goes on to say right through those next few chapters how Israel would be bound and broken and trapped. And in the 42nd chapter, the 42nd chapter, it says here, this is a people plundered and looted, all of them trapped in pits or hidden away in prisons, they have become plunder. With no one to rescue them, they have been made loot. And no one says, send them back, restore, restore, restore. How vivid that is. How realistic it is. And how fulfilled it was even in the Second War, the Second World War, when uh, Hitler came across uh, the whole of uh, Central Europe and ensnared it, overran it, and then hunted the Jews. And into the concentration camps they were sent, and many of them were sent not to work camps, but they were sent to death camps like Birkenau or uh, Auschwitz or Auschwitz, whichever way you want to pronounce. And when they came there, they were told in a suave and uh, silky sort of way, now you're going to be housed, but first we, firstly we want you to be uh, showered and then you will receive work clothes. So leave your cases and they will be returned to you either today or tomorrow or the next day. And blithely they obeyed and marched off in obedience to what was supposed to be the shower rooms. For many, it was the gas chamber. There were shower rooms and clothes were given, work clothes indeed, but they never saw their cases. They never saw their personal items, their clothing. And into some of those clothes were sewn diamonds and jewels and money and things of value because they thought, well, wherever we're going, and they knew nothing of where they were going, but wherever we're going, we, we need to set up a home and we'll need money and finance. So they'd sewn the diamonds, they'd sewn their gold, they'd sewn their jewels and valuables into the hems of their garments. And the Nazis knew this. And there was a place in Birkenau called Canada. Now, it was termed Canada because Canada uh, in those days was deemed to be, oh, the place everyone wants, us, uh, wants to live in. The grandeur of, of Europe with its Alps, its lakes, its wonderful freedoms, and its prosperity. Oh, we'd love to live in Canada. So. They nicknamed the sorting room for all these goods and uh, clothing and jewellery and everything that came, pots and pans as well, I might add. Uh, they all came into this great warehouse where slave labourers, Jews themselves, were going through and examining the clothes and feeling the hems and the linings of the clothes and discovering that there were jewels, there were diamonds, there was gold, there was money uh, sewn into them. And the Jews had done that for no other reason except they thought they would be setting up communities and homes and they believed a lie and they were destroyed by it. And so we read in the 42nd chapter of Isaiah, this is a people plundered and looted. All of them trapped in pits. And there were many pits in Eastern Central Europe where Jews built or dug their own graves and all stood on the side of them or within the pits and were mowed down by uh, firing squads. It's so graphic in your Bible, it's all there. They became plunder, 
and there was no one to rescue. And you ask today Jews that went through the Holocaust, all their children, and they'll say, look, the cry was, help us, and no one came. Now we know that there were the righteous Gentiles that did hunt Jews for one purpose, and that was to hide them, to look after them, to succor them. And they become part of the sheep nations who, when I was in prison, you visited me. When I was without clothing and naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. And on that judgment, when they are being rewarded eternally, those people will say, well, when, when did we do this? When did we see you, Jesus, naked, and we clothed you? We've done it for others, but when did we see you? When did we visit you in prison? When did we ever come and, uh, and, and give you to drink? And Jesus says, in that you did this to the least of my brethren. You see, he's using the words of Deuteronomy chapter 7. Because God says through Moses to Israel, I didn't choose you because you were the greatest. I chose you because you were the least. And many times he calls them my brethren. So scriptures are like little fragments. They are like jigsaw puzzle pieces. And you find by the Spirit of God that they interlock. And then you step back and you see a composite picture. So you might get a little jigsaw piece, a scripture, or half a phrase or a phrase in Isaiah, and that matches another one in Ezekiel. Put the two together and you get a graphic portrayal of either a prophecy or a state of being or something that God has done. Marvellous. And so we have here... God saying through Isaiah that the day would come when Israel would say, no one came and stood with us and no one said, restore them, restore them. I mean, it's unbelievable the battle that the survivors of the Holocaust suffered when they wanted, after all they'd gone through, to go to Palestine and establish Kibbutz is there and just live in freedom for at least as long as it took. The Arab nations, they stood up against them. Other nations did the same, posed it, even the United Kingdom. Amazing, isn't it? Those that had liberated them then rebound them, even on Cyprus, the Jews that were trying to get from Europe to Palestine, which later would become the modern state of Israel, were intercepted and put back into concentration camps. That's what it amounted to. Behind barbed wire, with limited food, these emaciated bodies, but strong of spirit, had to endure that indignity yet again first by their captors and now by their rescuers. And then finally, three years after the end of the war, when the atrocities were seen and conscience to a degree was felt and impacted within the hearts of many, the United Nations okayed Israel to be reconstituted and declared them to be the modern state of Israel. Well, bully for them, I want to tell you that God overrode that. God intervened. God stood up and spoke. So, uh, Isaiah says, which of you will listen to all the pain that Jacob has gone through? Who handed Jacob over to become loot? And Israel to the plunderers? Well, the Lord did indeed judge Israel in AD 70 and cast them out of the land because of their in, uh, iniquity, their stubbornness, 
and their refusal, their rebellious attitudes towards God and their refusal to humble themselves before God and worship him as God demands. John chapter 4. Remember what Jesus said? It's not here in Jerusalem in a temple. It's not in the Samaritan uh, temples. God seeks those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. And Israel resisted that. They said, no, we'd rather have a form. We'd rather have our ritual because you can put God into a compartment in religion and then be free to live the way you want to live and only just revisit God when it suits you. Well, Jesus says that's not good enough for Father. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You love yourself as God would have had you love your neighbour. But they resisted it. They resisted Jesus. They resisted the reason for his coming. They resisted all that he said and did. And they opposed him and sought to slay him. And indeed it appeared, won the day. But of course they didn't. The sovereignty of God. Always remember there are times where God is chastening his people or judging them, which is more severe, or or showing mercy to them when they are undeserving. And that's indeed what did happen. Let's go back to the psalmist in that beautiful Psalm 102. Psalm 102 says simply this, even though the horrors took place of what we know to be the Holocaust, suddenly God says, enough is enough. God is sovereign and he said there will be no further suffering on the scale that has been. How do we know this? Because we read it in Psalm 102 and it says, O Lord, you sit forever. Your renown endures through all generations. You will rise and have compassion on Zion. For it is time to show favour to her. So God is not only sovereign in chasing, chastening Israel, but also choosing Israel and bringing her home. For it is time to show favour to her. The appointed time has come. For her stones, the stones scattered. Now remember, you know, the psalmist uses this phrase, the stones, her stones, which stones? The stones of the temple, the stones of the walls around Jerusalem are dear to your servants. And they certainly were when they formed the temple precinct. You'll remember in the 24th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, verses 1 and 2, and beyond that, the disciples came to Jesus, and because they must have been at that vantage point looking over the city and then over the dominant uh, building, which was, of course, the temple, the smoke arising from the perpetual sacrifices, and they said, isn't that marvellous? Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that wonderful? And indeed it was. And Jesus said, the day is coming when there won't be one stone upon another. But the stones are precious. And they were precious to those disciples as those stones formed the temple. And even in them being demolished, the walls, the temple, the dwelling places of Jerusalem, and beyond Jerusalem, the whole of Israel absolutely razed to the ground. Over one million Jews were slaughtered by the Romans. 
even though that were the case, those stones scattered still meant something to the vanquished, to the grief-stricken, to the survivors that were the Jews. And then it says here, her stones are dear to your servants, her very dust moves them to pity. The nations will fear the name of the Lord and the day is coming when the kings of the earth will revere your glory for the Lord will rebuild Zion and suddenly, says one translation, suddenly will appear in his glory and he will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. There was a wail, there was a cry, there was a mourning, there was a moaning, there were tears, there was grief. Down through the ages since AD 70 and culminating in the Holocaust of the Jews suffering and in their anguish, crying out to God, crying out to God. And many of them died in that horrific place that we've talked about, Auschwitz, with with the terror on them of being gasping, and people gasping all around them as they were pressed together in their nakedness, and the gas was coming down through the cylinders there that were poured into the vents. And they felt God hasn't heard us. God hasn't heard us. God is not interested. God does not care. And there are many Jews that would feel that. They would not like this message. They would not want to listen to it. They would turn their back and say, we can do very well without God. But I want to remind you, and you should underline this, he will respond to the prayer. The prayer of the destitute, he will not despise their plea. And then he goes on to say something. With this we close. It says here in verse 18, let this be written for a future generation that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. You see, though Israel at the time of writing the psalm was going through so much, he said there is a greater suffering, there is going to be a time of greater mourning, there is going to be a time of greater grief, and the prayers will go up as a great mourning before God, and people will fear that God just doesn't care and turned his back on the people, but he had respect. And he had love and he remembered and will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. And what did he do? How did he respond? Well, he took them from the four corners of the earth. He took them not only from Central Europe, Eastern Europe, where they'd returned from the camps, those beleaguered survivors, but he took them from the ends of the earth, from Russia, from Ukraine, from Hungary. I remember once travelling through uh, through Ukraine in happier days than at the moment, and we were on a train going up into the uh, up into I think the Carpathian Mountains to minister. And I looked out on the, uh, on the station when our train had stopped just to pick up people. And on the adjoining or the opposite platform, there were a whole lot of people there sitting, huddling in the cold with loads and loads and loads and loads of bags. And uh, my friend, the interpreter that we had travelling with us said, oh, they're Hungarian Jews. They must have had some flag or identification that they were Hungarians. Oh, they said they'd be coming from Hungary and they would have come up from Odessa or they would have come in from Kiev on the train and they are waiting to go down to, that's right, down to Odessa uh, 
and they would be taking a boat to Haifa and making Alia back to Israel. I saw that with my own eyes. I saw the buses, the great buses uh, coming to pick up uh, people and taking them to the ports where they would board ships, just as the Bible says they will. But that's for another time. Good night. God bless you wherever you are. And I trust and pray that you'll pray for Israel because uh, there's a lot of licentiousness, a lot of sensuality, a lot of rebellion still in the hearts of Israel, God's people. And there is a day coming of great chastening. Again, that's for another time. God bless. See you real soon.